All right, John. Well, thanks for doing this, man. Thanks for coming on the program. And uh, we're here to talk about the new album, which I'm yes. excited about myself. It's a great record. I was glad to get great, to listen to it. Uh, but before we get into it, I think we owe the listeners a, uh, uh, an, a, an area of your expertise that we might not get to otherwise. So now that we're in the second stage of reopening in New York City, somebody shows up in Brooklyn, New York, and wants a good brisket or a good pastrami sandwich. What's the spot? Where's I know, the spots? I, I sensed that you were going to ask me this. Um, in Brooklyn, some good choices. Well, you know... Katz's is my favorite in all of New York. And, okay. um, you know, some people would say that it's a tourist trap and all these. It kind of is, but it's a really good pastrami sandwich. They have a satellite location in the Decal Market, which is off of Flatbush Avenue near mm. um, like uh, Junior's Deli, you know. So that's you can get a solid uh, pastrami sandwich there. Um, there's also uh, a Canadian style smoked meat place which is a thing mm. uh they have their own they have their own version of like pastrami and that's uh called mile end deli that's in like cobble hill area and then like but my kind of favorite place to take people is called david's brisket house it's off the fulton street a in like bed area um and that's just like it's a mom and pop run like they do their own brisket it's just like done with love and it's really good man i'll say what you order is almost as important as uh, where you go. And for me, a 50-50 pastrami slash corned beef Reuben mm, see, will leave you satisfied. I'm I'm a pastrami Reuben guy, but I respect the corned beef. And the 50-50, that's a rarely done play. I think that's, getting both. that's a wise getting move. Both. Why not? Why would you not do that? I don't know what I've been doing this whole time. Well, you know, now, now you know. Now you know. Hmm. Sage advice. We could probably stop here, but... Let's dig in. <laughs> I think we did it, man. I think, <laughs> I think that's, that's it. That's most of the knowledge that I have to offer. Yeah. You know? uh, oh, man, you've been killing it. Uh, recently, you've been on uh, playing lead trumpet on a lot of the my favorite records that have been coming out of out of the New York area in this last couple months. Um, the Weber Morris big band, uh, both yeah. are true. Uh, the, big, the Big Heart Machine record came out live at the Jazz Gallery, and then the original yeah. one as well. I've been checking both of those out. Um, and then you play lead also in your your own group, uh, New Alchemy Jazz Orchestra. That's correct. Uh, so you're yeah. you're making a shift here into into being the soloist. How long is yeah. how long has this record been in uh, not production, but how long has it been in your mind, and what inspired you to do this kind of a format? Well, you know, uh, this is really my debut record um, as you know for a small group or anything. I did a couple. I did some singles with the big band. Um, which I'm really happy with. Um, but, you know, in a sense, I've been thinking about this record since I've been playing trumpet and decided to make it my life, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple of records from this band that I, I co-led back in Denver, and the band was called Shirley, and we were like kind of a jazz rock hybrid. Um, one was one we did in like a guy's garage and another one we did in like a studio, and I'm really happy with those. But this is like my first real like jazz quintet record you know where like play an original tune and take solos and things like that sure um i've been working on the tunes on this record um roughly since i got to new york maybe the last five years or something or so it's taken me to write like all the originals on the on the record um which i'm really happy with mm -hmm. and uh yeah so about about that long i've been really thinking about wanting to do it sure. you know yeah uh, the, the originals sound great. You got how many uh, how many tracks? You got a bunch of originals and two covers, right? Yeah, let me look. I think three three covers. Um, we did Lady Bird. We kind of did a, a reimagining mm -hmm. of uh, of Lady Bird, and um, did a we played Shade of Jade pretty much straight up uh, the way it's you know was conceived. Uh, I did a, a horn chart on that, but and then. Mm -hmm. um, Paul Jones, the tenor saxophonist, he uh, arranged a beautiful version of Everything I Love, which is a kind of an underplayed Cole Porter standard. Hmm. Um, let me see if I can find this here. Yeah. Um, and those are the three, those are the three non-originals. Everything else, um, 
was from from me. Sure, I always appreciate that too. The you know being able to go back and pull some of the lesser heard but still beautiful you know maybe not standards or maybe standards from the those writers you know and kind of give yeah. them a new life because there's a lot of stuff that gets lost. You know, we've heard a lot of uh, all the things you are, but there's all kinds of really good stuff that's fallen through the cracks over the years, you know? Yeah, and, you know, I love all, every, all the things you are, and I love, you know, when I go to a jam session, I'm like, please call a tune I know. Um, but sure. when you're trying to make a statement on something, it's a little hard to really find something new on some of those, some of those tunes, you know? Sure. And uh, if you can find something that has that flavor, but maybe it's a little fresh in some way, that, that really helps a lot. Yeah. You know? Well, I feel like you really did that with Lady Bird, too. That's a really, it's a great arrangement because, you know, that's a great tune and Tad Dameron gets maximum credit. But yeah. you've, you've, it seems you've reimagined, it sounds like it could have been written, you know, as one of your originals in the record. It sounds like it could have oh, just been you, another, another one of the tunes. Like it takes on a new life doing that. Yeah, I really, um, I, I think I was just walking home one day and I started, you know, humming something, and I was like, oh, I'm singing Lady Bird, but I was singing it in, like, a 3-4, and uh, I was hearing, like, this root motion. Um, you know, what really inspired me was that uh, Robert Glasper record, Black Radio, mm -hmm. um, and there's a really cool version of Afro Blue that he does with Erica Badu on Oh, that. yeah. And it's just, like, takes the song into a completely different world, you know? Um, it's chilled out and cooled out, and, like, uh, I was just like, man, that would... That'd be such a cool vibe to do on uh, on Lady Bird, and uh, once I worked out the reharm, I love doing reharms, man. I feel like I could just do reharms for the rest of my life. Huh. It's like I love to take a, a piece of music and and just find out like what if this note wasn't the third, you know? What if it was the thirteenth, or what if it was the sharp nine, and what would that sound like? And and just the process of going through the whole tune and finding out what works and what sounds good, and that's kind of what I did for that tune. It just. Uh, takes a little time at the piano, but it's super rewarding, you know? Sure, yeah. And it gives you something that people recognize, but also you can do something new with it, and it isn't like, how am I going to rehash these tunes yeah. that have been played a hundred million times? Especially when it's a debut record, I don't want to, like, overwhelm people with my worldview, you know what I mean? And, like, I want to give them something they could, oh, Lady Bird, I know that, let me check that out. Oh, this is fresh, you know? Yeah. Uh, rather than, like, a an eight-movement suite you know, or something like that. Sure. Like, I want, want people to have somewhat of an idea of what I'm, what I'm getting into as a new face, you know? No doubt, yeah. Although I think you, I mean, you strike the balance well because there's a lot, of, I mean, you bring your own personality to the thing and all these are original, you know, there's so much original music that speaks to what it is that you're doing, but also you, you throw those little nods into the tradition, which I think is yeah. great. I think it's easy to forget about that too. And when I heard Shade of Jade, I was like, yeah, I love this tune. This is a, this is a classic, you know, and you did, you did, did great, great stuff with it. It's a cool tune. But it's yeah. just one of those things you go, oh, yeah. You know, and when people play tunes on gigs, you know, you go, all right, yeah, that's it. You know, this is, yeah, this is cool. Yeah, I love this tune. Yeah. I love this tune. Um, and it's just like some tunes just energize you as a player. You know, as a trumpet player, it's like um, some tunes just kind of get you going. You know what I mean? Sure. And it's like you can write a tune like... Oh, I need a tune kind of like Shade of Jade. Uh, I can write a, you know, a C minor thing. And it's like, it's, you know, it's not the same. You just need to get, <laughs> you yeah. need to get the real thing sometimes, sure. you know? Yeah. Um, my mastering engineer had like a funny saying, uh, the guy at Big Orange Sheep, uh, Michael Perez Cisneros, who's a genius uh, at mixing and mastering, man. Mm -hmm. But he was like, you know, we're talking about like, there's, there's some traditional stuff on the record and some hard bop stuff. Uh, he's like, your record is like the ACDC of, of jazz records. <laughs> <laughs> and like being okay. from Ohio and like growing up on like classic rock. And I was like, yeah, I know. I get it. I'm I'll take that as a, I'm choosing to take that as a compliment. Sure. You know, well, that's hilarious. Wait, why? Because the blending of of like what, what, what do you take from that? How do you I think it's just that it's like a really like a straight like there are parts of it where this just this is a straight ahead jazz record. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And like it's. Uh, can be aggressive in spots, and it's um, it's just kind of like, uh, you know, I don't want to go too deep with the analogy. I don't want to. <laughs> <it's laughs> yeah, like, right. We all love ACDC, but, you know. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, Did I just think that it's like, um, you know, it's there's some fresh stuff in there, and there's some there's some of the stuff that we all know and love in there, too. Sure. You know, like the, the hard bop stuff and... Uh, uh, the one tune I wrote that's um, dedicated to Horace Silver, Pearls of the Tartar, I mean, I just wanted to write something that he he could have written, mm -hmm. you know? Sure. Um, 
and I still think, but I still think it sounds modern, and I, I still think Horace's stuff sounds modern too. Sure, you know, yeah, it's amazing going back to some of those records too. I've I've put on Dizzy Gillespie records from the '40s and be like, wait a minute, what is he? He was doing this stuff 70 yeah. years ago. It's yeah, kind, it's kind of amazing. Now, did you do you think so? You come from a, a wide range of styles of music. I mean, between playing, uh, you know, let's say funk and R and B music, and playing, uh, you know, the um, New Alchemy Jazz Orchestra in many regards yeah. is pretty straight ahead. That's in its own world. Yeah. Plus, playing all in these super modern big bands, you're playing lead and all this stuff. Did you have a conception of the style, or did you just say, "I'm just going to play some music that I like, and this is the world that you that you like to live in"? In that respect, for the record, you mean? Mm-hmm. Um. You know, I, I wouldn't say I had. I knew I wanted it to be like, uh, like straight ahead modern jazz. You know, I think you're you're right. I do tend to run in like a lot of different circles. And like, uh, for example, the uh, Angela Morris Anna Weber big band is like a lot of avant garde cats, and I, I love that music. And I, I, I uh, when I was in Boulder, Colorado, I was studying with this guy Art Landy, who's like a very avant garde pianist and just an avant garde person, really, if you <laughs> get to know him. Um, and, uh, you know, I also love straight ahead jazz and I, you know, I, I really love it all, but I think when you're kind of, um, I've been a sideman for a long time. And I think when you decide to step out as a band leader and say, this is me, um, you got to kind of make choices about what kind of music you're going to, um, you're going to pursue. And like jazz, uh, like any art form, especially in music, it's like, it's very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, discreet, you know, like there's like this group of people, especially in New York, I feel this way. Maybe uh, maybe you do too. I agree, yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's like this group of people and this group of people and this group of people. And there might be some interlopers in between, but like, especially like you have like the Smalls, uh, Mesro scene, um, and then you have like uh, the guys in Brooklyn doing the more avant-garde stuff, and then you have like, uh, you know, like the ho- the bands that play in like hotel lobbies that just play, you know, it's like, uh, there's so many different ways to get at it, but like you have to kind of choose what's your, what your message is going to be and what your identity is going to be as a, as an artist. Sure. Um, and I'm glad that I did that now. I'm a little older to release, uh, a debut album. I'm 36, but like to do that with some, um, uh, intention rather than to just be like, I like these songs, you know? Sure. Uh, and to have, yeah, have crafted that over time in some yeah. respect. Yeah, and the you know? songs, like, I've gotten to a point with my mm-hmm. writing where it's like, yeah, I do have a little bit of a style. I do have a little bit of a sound, mm-hmm. and it, it kind of speaks for itself, you know? Sure, yeah. Man, I struggled with that a little bit when I first came to town and probably do still that that sort of differentiation between the styles. It feels like, in some respect, you really have to dig into that thing that you do. And the people who are like, you know, so, like noise musicians versus the people mm-hmm. who are like big band players or whatever they stay in their yeah. kind of circles whereas growing up in Boston it was kind of like everybody was expected to do everything in a certain in a certain way like it's yeah. a different thing I think you know I I make a uh, I, until this year I was making a living as a musician playing trumpet mm-hmm. you know and one of the things my um my teacher through undergrad and grad school this guy Brad Good is phenomenal trumpet player and musician mm-hmm. incredible um but he really taught me the value of being versatile. And like the, he taught me, you know, the importance of like, yeah, you should be able to sight read, be able to play lead trumpet and, and be flexible, you know, and and um, keep an open mind about things. And that's why I think I was able to work in, in a lot of different bands. And, um, you know, you have to kind of keep your mind open. And, and I like all that music. You know, it's not like I just only like playing straight ahead jazz and I do the other stuff for the money. Like, I like playing all of it. I love playing in funk pop bands, too, you know? Sure. Um, That can be hard then to pivot and say, I'm this person, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, I play this style of music, and I just do it with my band, these four people, you know? Sure. Um, Sometimes I'm envious of people that are able to do that or choose to do that. I wish that I could just be, like, you know, the artist. But, uh, you know, I've always wanted to play with as many people as possible. And that's, that's part of, uh, you know, the career I've, I've made for myself. Sure. Know? And it's a, it's a pretty, I would say, rare accomplishment to be able to make a living as a trumpet player. Because there's a lot of people that do a lot of different things. But, and there are piano players and bass players and drummers who make a living at it. But you got to yeah. commit, really. I mean, you definitely have to be versatile. It's, it's, unless you're, 
I mean, even people who are prominent, people who lead their own bands have got to teach or do something else, you know, to make it happen. Yeah, but you mentioned Boston. I think that another point to that is like, I, so I went to college in Cincinnati and started playing my first gigs there. It's a town of like 300,000 people. Um, and then I moved out to Boulder, Colorado and Denver. And it's like, you know, there's not nearly enough gigs for there to be like this group of people and this group of people. You know, there's like... Sure. You just kind of have to learn how to do it all um, because otherwise you're not going to be playing very much at all. And I think having those experiences, maybe this um, correlates with your experience in Boston, but like um, just being around to do all those different types of gigs really informs, you know, it's it's just knowledge. I mean, it's it's really valuable to have all that knowledge of, of what it's what a salsa trumpet should sound like versus a small group jazz trumpet. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. And I'm sure there's I mean, if we went through the history of it, I'm sure a lot of our heroes, too, are people who spe I mean, you don't think of Coltrane as being an R&B saxophone player. But there was some point in his yeah. career when he's standing on the bar, you know, playing yeah. rhythm and blues tunes or whatever. Like there's a lot. All these people had different experiences or Monk playing in gospel bands or whatever. Like, you know, yeah. it all informs what it is that you're doing. You got to pay the rent, man. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although we live in a different time now. You can't do a week at the five spot and make your rent for the month or whatever. But. Uh, you no, know, especially now, <laughs> but we make it work. Now, there's a lot of people. I'll tell you this. This speaks to a to another point uh, that I think is interesting about what you're doing, which is that a lot of even outside of the stylistic discrepancies, trumpet players in particular tend to be lead trumpet players or soloists. But here, I'm glad to get to hear you really stretch out because most of the time I'm hearing you, you're playing the lead parts. Uh, yeah. How do you balance those two things? As a trumpet player myself, I know the the strenuous uh, nature of playing the lead parts and being able to execute in that kind of a fashion and lead a whole band, and then also the let's say rigor and creative requirements in being your own solo voice. Yeah, um, it's really hard. It's really hard to balance it, and it's um, actually the older I get, and the you know. I like to think the better I get at doing each of them, it, it becomes harder and harder to split between the two. You know, like when I did this, re when I did this record and I've talked to, there's a couple other um, really talented um, lead jazz soloists uh, that I talked to about this. It's like from the mouthpiece to the way you play the trumpet is so different, you know, like the voice that I have in my ear for, myself as a soloist is not the same voice that I have in my ear for myself as a lead player. So, mm -hmm. you know, for example, for this record, um, I didn't, I turned down gigs on lead for about three, four weeks before it. And I was just shedding, uh, the tunes on my big mouthpiece in my room with my nice compact sound, you know, playing towards a fictional microphone, um, and just trying to really cultivate that voice. Um, mm. Because it it is so different, uh, the physical nature of the trumpet is a is a physically very demanding instrument to play. Um, it's like if you you know, I mean, if you if you don't play for a little while, it goes out the window. It's like wait, yeah, it's <laughs> well, not like riding a I, bike or whatever. This is it's like people don't realize it. People don't realize what's involved. But I always remember yeah. there's an interview with Dizzy Gillespie where the guy goes, "So does it get easier over the years?" And he's like, no, man, it gets harder every day. He's like, every time I open the case, it's staring at me, trying to, like, take me down. Yeah, it's it's brutal, man. And, like, so then you practice a lot, and then, like, you overpractice, and then your chops don't work. And, you know, it's like the balance is, um, I mean, like, literally every trumpet player that I know has had some sort of chop problem in their life. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. or, like amazing world-class lead players are like, oh man, I can't, you know, this week is a tough week. Something's going on. It's like, sure. Yeah. It's, it's just like, it gets everybody at some point. Um, so it's just, it's a lot of time. It's a lot. That's really what it comes down to is like, you can never forget about the condition of your chops and, um, you got to spend time on it every day. Um, so basically when I look at my calendar and I'll say, uh, I have this gig on Wednesday, it's a jazz gig. And I have uh, lead gigs the rest of the week. You know, you kind of have to prioritize uh, what the gig is. You know, um, how who's going to be listening and 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 uh, how you're going to pay your rent and all these things come together and you you work out your 
at least I, I work out my practice schedule accordingly. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously when you're playing a lot, you don't have as much time or chops to practice. Uh, that's not really an issue now. Um, right. Sure. But, you know, it's just uh, it's a struggle. I mean, it's definitely a struggle. Yeah. You you played you will play lead, right? Very rare. I just I've just written myself off as doing that. I play funk stuff. I'll play Atomic yeah. Funk Project stuff. You know, I'll play you AFP. Know, whatever. But uh, yeah, if somebody calls me to do it in a big band, I'll say you got you should probably get somebody else, man, because it's I just uh, between the struggle that I face is I've just written that off so that I can write basically because I try to spend as much time writing as I can on top of yeah. improvising and everything else. So that requirement of you know you have to do some amount of time every day keep your chops up and make sure you're doing the gigs when you can and everything but uh yeah and it's, that's its own world man i have a lot of respect for lead trumpet players because that's that's its own world you know well we respect you too you know oh well thank you i appreciate it <laughs> i'll tell you the other thing about it you know it, it's an interesting point too not just the um the switch from lead to being a soloist but also the just in terms of the range or the endurance or the the nature of the sound, but the stylistic choice, like going from one mouthpiece to another or getting a different sound out of the horn or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's Mm -hmm. not, you know, if you're a saxophone player, you can have somebody change their mouthpiece in the horn and the ligature or whatever, the reeds, and all of a sudden you have like a completely different sound. You can really craft that. But so much of our sound as trumpet players comes from just the shape of our face and stuff like that. Yeah. So, what are you doing to like? How would you switch? Bet- like, what are you thinking about stylistically? Do you think about other things beyond like what, like equipment or like different exercises that you'll do, or how do you get yourself in kind of a different mindset for the soloist part? Like, when the, with those four weeks or whatever, you weren't doing lead gigs. I bring everything in for one thing. I think of my sonic space as being much smaller. It's like a area about the size of a beach ball around my belt. You know, um, when I'm playing lead, I'm thinking about like a laser beam that goes to the back of the room, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, That's one thing. I know I puff my cheeks out more when I'm playing, like, soloistically, and I wish I didn't do that. I'm going to try to get... That's my pet project during the quarantine is to stop doing that. Sure. (laughs) It's not going well. Um, But... um, I wonder if that's it, just well. This is going to be too esoteric trumpet nonsense for the general audience here, mm. so whatever. But I wonder if some of that because I find myself doing that at times as well. But a lot of the times to manipulate the pitch, that is, yeah. it's easier to do it that way that sometimes than yeah. whatever. But you don't want to. You wouldn't be doing that playing lead anyway. Well, it's better if you can just play in tune, you know, with your de facto setup. Um, and I think sure. the more that you practice that way and are, are aware of it, the better it gets, you know? Um, mm-hmm. It's kind of a quick fix to puff your cheeks out, um, to play in tune, or to maybe uh, fluff up the sound a little bit, if you want that sultry kind of pillowy sound. Um, it's a cheap fix, but it's it destabilizes the embouchure, and it can lead to um, some issues down the road, you know? Sure. And um, also tire you out in the short term. Your yeah, short term You lose your endurance if you're like... You know, whatever. Yeah, if you're constantly uh, uh, destroying the integrity of your embouchure, you know. Um, I think about that. I think about the breath. Uh, I think about when I'm a soloist, I really think about fluidity. I think that's the the best adjective that I can think of mm. for how I want to sound is fluid. Um, one pr- trumpet player that I think of particularly like that is um, uh, uh, Michael. Is it Michael, Michael Rodriguez? Mm, could be. Who does he no. play with? I guess. We Chick should Korea. know. Okay, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Can you cut this out? <laughs> we'll cut I'm this like, part out where we don't know trumpet players. I know his name. I'm. Uh, well, you know, another guy who's like Alex Sipiagin is like incredibly sure. fluid. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. How do you think about practicing that? Scales, you know, um, I do scales um, up to the ninth and back down. I, I practice all kinds of different. I really love the uh, Phrygian scale and the mm-hmm. um, Lydian augmented scale. Um, sure. It's like those, that's like the, um, I feel like the Phrygian scale is like the darkest scale. 
Um, yeah, Mike Rodriguez. Yeah, duh. That's his name. Right. Um, you get credit. You remembered. I was right. Um, there you go. But if you listen to him play, it's just like uh, it's just so connected, and uh, every part of his 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 range is so uh, uh, resonant, you know. And I really mm-hmm. admire that about his playing. Um, but so yeah, scales and um, getting good clean valve movements, you know, making sure the valves go all the way down, and all the notes are sounding uh, individually. Um, sure. And, you know, now, our pen, now, it's not a secret. It's not a huge secret, you know. Um, yeah. But now but those sound uh, to me like those are technical, co- like, concepts. Those are like, yeah. all right, you have to have the stuff under your fingers. If, when you mm-hmm, say, mm-hmm. when I think of fluid, I, I think, I often think of it as being like, maybe uh, maybe I put it in the same category as linear, or it, be, it takes on a sort of more conceptual uh, place in my mind. But sometimes mm. it seems to me those sort of the conceptual approaches like how do you be fluid how do you connect ideas in a certain way it's interesting mm. that you should talk about them as being sort of more in the technical uh physical end even with scales which are sort of a you know repetition and absorbing the scales themselves or whatever as opposed to a conceptual approach yeah um you know i don't when it comes to like what I'm playing, the content of what I'm playing, mm-hmm. um, I just try to to listen and and uh, participate, you know. And knowing when I'm, it's weird because sometimes I really wish I was a piano player or a bass player and play a more supporting role. Sure, you know, I know that feel. It's like whenever whenever I'm playing, I'm the star and everybody's focused on me. And sometimes I just want to like help out. You know, yeah, you know I mean? 100%. I and, totally get it. And yeah, get yeah. in the groove and feel the groove. Um, but, you know, when I'm when I'm playing a solo, um, I'm just trying to like, I think the ideas come. I don't it's for me, if anything, it's like learning how to edit on the fly, learning how to um, when to stop, sure. and take a breath and, mm-hmm. and when to be. Um, when I realize that I'm, I'm not really phrasing anything, I'm just playing a bunch of stuff, you know, sure. Um, that's the challenge for me. Um, yeah. So just trying to be really aware and cultivating awareness is a difficult thing to do anyways, you know, even in our lives. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. So I've done some, you know, I've, I've done a little bit of meditation. I'm not religious about it. Um, and just trying to be like really um, not let the, the hamster wheel just take over. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. So you try and to be something- present within the music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's hard. It's hard to do, especially because like, I mean, when I got to New York, um, I considered myself a jazz player who played lead. Mm -hmm. And then New York told me it was the opposite, (laughs) you know, but like, so I didn't get a lot of jazz gigs, uh, but I would go to jam sessions and play. And I I really think I overdid it on the jam sessions. Now I hardly ever go to jam sessions um, because like, it's just it can be a great place to go and meet people and celebrate music and, and learn something. And, um, and I met, I certainly met a lot of people doing it, but like, I think it's not good for what you're talking about in terms of fluidity of ideas. And like at a jam session, um, you know, some guys will play for five minutes, but that's kind of rude, you know? So it's usually like one chorus or two choruses and, and duck out. And, uh, it's really hard to, um, Tell a story in one chorus. Sure. And I'll tell the other thing, I don't know if you you may have experienced this as well, but the nature of jam sessions are very often too, it takes on a uh, what's the best way to put this? An aggressive character that you might not get if you're playing your own gig. Or I often note the difference between when I have jam sessions in my house and I can invite people and we can hang and play and try to be creative and musical. And if totally. some, you know, you, somebody calls a tune, somebody goes, eh, remind me of the changes on the bridge on that or whatever. You know, you go yeah. to Smalls and you, uh, wait, does anybody, just, can somebody remind me of the name of the, what, what the changes are? And the, people are like, get out of here. You know, it's it, it turns crickets. into a yeah. very different kind of vibe. So especially for the musicality, like it's hard to imagine, you know, Ben Webster playing like a beautiful ballad, in, you know, at a, your average New York jam session. Yeah, I mean... 
Yes, I agree with you. I like that. Like the cultivated sessions are really my favorite thing. I've worn out everybody in Brooklyn by calling them to come play with me at iBeam, you know? Sure. Uh, yeah. Which I love iBeam. Uh, Brian Dry, trombonist, uh, has this space in Gowanus. It's like, it's got a gorgeous piano, a really nice drum set. It's just like a really excellent spot to shed and have sessions. And that's mm -hmm. where I do all my rehearsals and everything. But um, it's just so much better. Uh, you can play to call your friends up and play, um, you know, a handful of originals, so do some reading, maybe some standards, um, and to really stretch out and, and feel each other out. That's what I like about jazz music is like um, the interaction and the uh, what are we creating together, not like I've just played a perfect uh, piano chorus and now, you know, so-and-so is going to play perfect time behind me. I'm not, perfection is uh, really cool when it happens, Mm -hmm. But it's very frustrating to pursue, and it's um, it's kind of a zero sum game. It's like I was either perfect or I wasn't perfect. You know what I mean? Sure. That, it's like perfect bebop thing. Um, is is a challenge to be successful at, and there's some people who do it really well. But uh, for me, it's more entertaining and fun to play. You know, maybe a little bit more relaxed and and more open with things. Sure. You know. I, so that's another reason why the the jam session thing trailed off for me is just because like I never and there's so many I don't mean to talk shit about anybody or any of the places in town but like there's so many great sessions and I would always walk out being like Ugh, I really didn't play that well or like you know just is not terribly good for like your psyche as an artist you want to feel like good about what you're creating and uh, motivated to create more you know sure yeah yeah, and I, I'm with you, and I also appreciate, I mean, a lot of my favorite musicians really took risks and took the opportunity to take risks, and sometimes yeah. the greatest stuff comes out of, like, all right, you wouldn't, it's not maybe technically perfect, or it wouldn't be the most, I don't know, I don't even know how you gauge that, because so many good yeah. solos are just rife with who knows what's going on, but it's about the spirit of the thing more than it is about, you know, exacting the correct whatever, yeah. phrase or whatever. I will exactly. say, in defense of jam sessions, there is a because I'm on your team on That's this. That's a great title for a song, by the way. In defense of jam defense sessions. Defense of jam sessions. All right, <laughs> I will write it down. Uh, there is. There's also something to be said, just to be fair, about like the idea of showing up in a place and and the nature of like I've been to Smalls as an example late at night when people were just absolutely crushing, and there's a yeah. there's like it's almost an athletic like super aggressive vibe that I don't necessarily want to be in all the time. But when you see people who can really play, who are playing some like really intense music and they're out to cut each other in a certain way, there's, there is yeah. a time where you're like, all right, this is, this is a vibe here for sure. You know, there's really nothing like it, man. I mean, like the fact that you can walk, that's what I really wanted. I mean, like, like I told you, I, I came up in those smaller towns and that's what I really wanted to experience was in New York was like to swim with the sharks, basically to swim in the deep water and see how it went. Yeah. And it's like, you know, it goes OK. Like I do all right. But like, man, you can just go into these clubs any night of the week and just be like, what the fuck is that guy doing? <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like it's, yeah. it's inspiring. It's like it's pretty unbelievable, you know. Yeah. And just like the type of people that would show up. You know, I never did. um I saw Roy around town a couple of times, but I never did like I was never at Smalls when Roy Hargrove came and like played, you know, and that's probably <laughs> evidence that I what, haven't been there enough. Um, but uh, just the fact that guys like that would show up and, and get on the bandstand and, and you could be playing with a, you know, a world class piano player like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Man, I was there a, a number of times when uh, when Roy would show up, but it was always and it was amazing that he actually wanted to do it because he could have done anything he wanted you know he could have yeah. i mean he didn't have to be there at all but for him right, right. to be there and to kind of uh i guess lend his experience to people who were just there to play was yeah. uh you know was great but every time he showed up i would just like crash and burn man you know like i remember the first time i saw him i went and i was playing a tune i played the head i'm like cool okay everything's cool and then just erupting from the shadows of the club was Roy Hargrove just staring me in the eyes. And immediately I was like, well, I, I'm going to have to just play everything that I've ever learned <laughs> real quick. You know, you get into that mindset. Let me show Roy like, how good I am. <laughs> There's no way to do that. But your brain just goes on automatic. Whoa, I better play something good yeah. here. Let's go into the thing. Man. And then he, he stepped up and played right after me and just played the most beautiful melodic solo of all time. Just like only the That's notes the he crusher. needed. Yeah. That was, that was the thing, you know. 
Yeah, it's like when you know, in like those movies, when you see like a guy with a samurai sword and he like slices four times, and like no, the guy doesn't move, and then all of a sudden he starts to slide <laughs> apart. That's like, that's like Roy Hargrove. You know what I mean? Just like exactly. just what's necessary. It's like you didn't even know what he did until he did it. Yeah. Exactly right, which is really interesting. I think he really got into that in particular later in his life. I mean, he was always melodic, but in the beginning, he was a, he was a lot more fiery. He probably had a lot to do with just his, you know, whatever, his chops or whatever, but like... It's just youth, man, like, you know, like playing playing with youthful vigor and anger and all the things, you know, it's like... Uh, in some ways, I feel like it's better for me. I I'm better as I get older, not because I get better at the trumpet, which I am getting better at the trumpet, uh, I hope. But also just like I'm chilled out personally more. You know what I mean? I'm not so like, I got I to gotta play the Trump, you know, I got to play my solo and uh, impress everybody and all that stuff. Like, I just like, whatever, man, I'm just going to try to sound good. You know, that's yeah. kind of the, that's all there is. That's all you can do is try to try to sound good and try to communicate something. Absolutely. You know? Yep. 100%. And that's something that I think, I think that you, you're, you're right that, you, you know, you learn that as experience, you know, with experience over time, but it's not an easy thing to sit down in a practice room and or whatever no. it's not an easy lesson to learn you just have to do it and i think every guy yeah. has said everybody said that you listen to pe- every interview i've ever heard with anybody it says the same thing which is as they get older they just play fewer notes because they know you know they know how to do it say more with less you know yep no doubt uh so let's go back to this record real quick where sure. so you recorded it at big orange sheep yeah that seems to be the spot a lot of people are recording over there uh, and I, I got some really good recommendations about that place uh, from a, like Julian Shore and Caleb Curtis. And man, they were right. It's killing. I knew uh, the owner, Chris Benham, is a, is a great drummer. And I knew him from around the scene, just a couple sessions here and there. Um, I think we actually played some wedding gigs together. OK, uh, but he's a brilliant drummer and he's a really great studio engineer. And he tracked the thing. Um, it's gorgeous, man. And they just got a brand new Fazioli piano. It's like, um, I think it might be the only one in New York. I'm not sure, but uh, oh wow, it's a great spot, man. It's a really. Have you been there? Have you recorded there? No, I've never been there. I've heard I've heard all, all good things. Yeah, it's world class, man. It really is. The, the record sounds great too. I mean, there's, a, there's just the sound is awesome. What, how did you yeah. record it? It was to what degree was everything isolated, and to what degree did you think like? How do we capture the spontaneity of the group and also try to capture a maximally clean sounding album? Yeah. Um, well, I, I prefer albums. I, I have some really, um, you know, I, I know what I like in terms of, of album sounds and I know a little bit about audio production and um, just from over the years doing different gigs to to scratch a living together uh, i used to do live sound for some concert venues in cincinnati and i i had my own pa rig in denver that i would do gigs with um but i knew that on a recording i i kind of like i don't love the way a record sounds when everybody's in the same room mm-hmm. you know and a lot of um diehard jazz traditionalists would be like oh you got to get everybody in the same room you know you uh the sound quality is not as good, but the performance is so much better. And I just, I don't know, man, some of my favorite records are isolated, you know, mm-hmm. it just leaves so much room for, um, like those ECM records, man, Kenny Wheeler records. It's just like, they sound like they're in outer space, you know, sure. it's like, that's a very distinctive sound. That's more than just the room too. the ECM stuff. A lot of that had a very, had a certain color to it. Yeah. It's a lot of reverb and uh, a certain kind of reverb. Um, but I just like, the way that being isolated kind of captures everybody's sound better. So we had the drums in a room, bass in a booth, uh, piano in a room, and then the horns were in the, the main room, the live room. And um, that gave us a lot of uh, uh, flexibility. Also, like switching between takes sometimes uh, if we wanted to do an edit. But more importantly, I just like you get the, the instruments sound better. You mm-hmm. know, because sure. you don't have a ride cymbal coming through the piano microphone, yeah. you know, so you get this nice, rich piano microphone. I was able to do uh, two different mics on my trumpet, which I've always wanted to do. I think it's a super cool move. Sure. Pro pro gamer move. Yep. To put two go. microphones on. What were the mics? And, what'd, you, uh, what'd you use for mics for the nerds? Um, I used, um, well, the, there's a microphone that uh, I actually uh, am an endorsing artist for. It's uh, this, this cat in uh, the U.K., I mean, Ireland, I'm not sure. Michael Barkley, 
Um, he makes these uh, microphones. He's a trumpet player. I met him on Trumpet Herald. It's a website yeah. uh, where people talk about mouthpieces. Yeah, old and, school, man. That's like I feel like that 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 website was around at the beginning of trumpet forums. Yeah, it's one of the older ones, man. Um, but uh, there's some good guys on there. Some good guys, and uh, <laughs> Michael's one of them. And he made these microphones that are killer, man. They're really like. I played a lot of microphones, and I honestly like his the best, you know. Wow. And I'm not just saying that because I'm endorsing. Like, I wouldn't play it if I didn't like it. Sure. And it's a, it's a screaming value, man. It's a really good deal on a on a great mic. What's the name of the mic? So what's the, what's it called? It's the Barkley Microphone uh, Infinity Ribbon Mic. Cool. Um, and so I use that, and then the other mic I used was an AEA R44, which is like a copy of an old RCA ribbon mic. Mm-hmm. And it's a they're both ribbon mics, but they have very different sounds. Cool. Interesting. Um, yeah, the R- the the AEA is is much darker and has like a kind of a scratchy wooliness to it, mm-hmm. um, which is so important to have. But uh, I think the majority of the trumpet sound on the record is coming from the Barkley mic because it's like, you know, it's a ribbon, so it's a little bit veiled and um, and puff like not puffy, but like um, just uh, you know, the trumpet can sound very brittle, and a ribbon microphone is great at making it sound a little uh, more mellow. Sure. So it's got that characteristic, but it's also very clear in the uh, mid-high register, uh, which some ribbon mics don't have. Yeah. Uh, it's like the part of the spectrum that makes speech clear, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so it has this kind of sparkling brilliance to it that I really enjoy. So, the you know, my trumpet sound is, is mostly the Barkley mic, and then some of the uh, AEA kind of slides in underneath to give it that, that big, big bassy sound. Sure. You know? Yeah, there you go. And how, cl- how close... So you did two, it was two horns. Actually, let's do this real quick. Go through the, um, sure. who's the personnel? Who's the personnel on the record? So the quintet is me uh, on trumpet and Paul Jones on tenor saxophone, Stephen Feifke on piano, Marcos Varela on bass, and Jeff Davis on drums. And then for uh, two or three of the tunes, or three of the tunes, we added an alto saxophonist, and that's Michael Thomas um, mm-hmm. of the Terraza big band and... He has his own project that just came out that's really good. Um, oh, yeah, so I was really happy to get him on Jason a couple Palmer. things also. That's an amazing yeah. record. I was, yeah. got to check it out recently. Uh, so were you, how close were you guys in the room? Was it like a did you was it a communication between the horns? Because that's another element too. Like if you're trying to, if there's any edits that need to be done. There's a question too about like all right how how isolated yeah. can you be in the in a room with the horns? We were like three feet apart, and the mics are like front address, you know. So it it, it wasn't there wasn't too much bleed, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's going to be some, obviously, but uh, we didn't really didn't have any problems with that, and we had rehearsed and everything, so stuff was pretty tight. Uh, um, yeah, you know, pretty standard. Sure. Now, is this a group that you'd put together before, or are these people that you played with a lot, or how, how, where did this? Where did this particular iteration come from? And then also, did yeah. you get the opportunity to play with the group in advance, or did you just do a bunch of rehearsals, or how did you prepare the music? We had done a couple rehearsals. I mean, it started off with just, like, um, having sessions at iBeam and just knowing, like, some people that I knew that I really liked their playing and I liked the way we played together, and more than that, the way we just vibed together personally, you know? Sure. Um, there's that lots of guys you play with. Yeah, the, there's lots of guys you play with, and they're just like, yeah, cool, you know, it's like... Do you actually like playing? Like, I don't. <laughs> like, do you want to be here? Yeah. Um, and they might be fantastic musicians, but it's just like, um, but like these guys are just, you know, really sweet guys and amazing players and very supportive uh, musically and otherwise. Um, so I was really happy to get all of them on the record. Um, we had played a gig. I don't, I'm really bad about uh, booking myself and, and putting my gigs out there. And uh, I was really not looking forward to doing a um like a release show i didn't want to do one. Oh, really i don't i don't <laughs> like emailing people and asking for gigs and i don't like doing it five times to get told no and yeah. i don't like um you know i just really don't like putting myself out there uh, this record has actually taught me a lot about the value of doing that in a way that feels you know authentic um, interesting this pro- this process but honestly like when COVID hit and all the gigs were canceled I was like whew I don't ah. have to do that <laughs> I don't have to do that now um, that's hilarious now- man because I, I had the opposite experience where I put out an album oh, really? I was like alright this whole thing has been a drag but at least I get to play the music but I hate yeah. the I hate the emailing and that nobody wants to do their own 
do their own booking. It's ter- it's the worst yeah. part of playing music for sure. Yeah, it is. I mean, well, how many like, people are you, you going to bring out? And are we got to make X amount of money? And uh, there's got to be uh, there's yeah. going to be a such and such. You know, I don't know. Yeah, I've had friends get their gigs canceled because the presale wasn't high enough. And oh yeah, um, it's brutal, man. Brutal. And I, I mean, the, I'm just I like, understand the. I get the business side of it, but also there's it's just a t- you just don't want to. We didn't get into we we just want to play. We're in the position yeah. musicians want to play, and it's a tough one. You but that's the nature of the that's where we live, and that's where where we're at. You know, you have to do the work yourself. I also love to I love to hang, and like I like I mentioned before, I'd love to sometimes think of my a way to to play in a more supportive role, you know, rather than just being like the soloist or whatever. Um, I think that's my personality is more to just like help things along. So sure. that, like the idea of like getting on stage and everybody coming to see me play my music, like kind of terrifies me, you know? Sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and it's I, like, uh, I've done it and I continue to do it, but it's just, I'm just like, eh, I don't have to be doing that all the time. You know? Yeah. We may share that, John. And it seems like in opposition to the standard trumpet player mentality, I feel like trumpet players a lot of the time get into it because they want to, uh, they want to be the guy, you know, they want to be the, the warrior on the front of the thing or whatever but to me i'm, I'm it on could your be team. selection bias i mean we the ones who do that are the most visible so that's who we see you know sure that's a fair point that's a fair point though i've met a lot of trumpet players and there is a it's a it's a wild group <laughs> yeah it's pretty i mean it's pretty diverse i love that's what i love about big band is just like sitting in the back row and like talking shit and like <laughs> kind of like the being the the bad kid in class you know and like you know, I'll just play my high notes and you can leave me alone kind of thing, you know? Sure. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. That's funny, though, because it still puts you as the leader of the group in some respects. Maybe not, but you're <laughs> musically, you know the deal. Yeah. Uh, so did you did you have the gigs lined up and they they fell through? Or it was just by the time this was going to come out, I guess we would have known that it was... Who, yeah. Who knows what was going to happen? That's pretty much what happened. I was a little behind the eight ball with the release on a couple points, um, fronts like getting a publicist and... Um, scheduling a gig um, so I knew it was going to be maybe the gig was going to be a few weeks after the record came out or something like that it's not terribly important that it comes out on the exact day you know my fans will have to wait sure. I'm sure they'll be all right um, but uh, you know I, I would like to I would like to play this music um, at a show somewhere in the city uh, when when that's available to us again when we can do that you know sure yeah no um, doubt for finding a, a room that I feel comfortable in and that I like the sound of and that I like, you know, the promoter and all that stuff is important to me, you know? Sure. I think that, I think that is important building the relationship with the venue and knowing places that are going to be into what you're doing and are going to be on your team and are who going to help promote or who are at least going to be, give you an environment that's going to be conducive yeah. to, to, you know, whatever. Did, have you ever, have you ever read David, this, this, this only comes up in this particular concept, but David Byrne's book, um, How Music Works? I'm not sure if I read that one. I know there was a couple books that came out at the same time, um, mm. about like how, how music affects your brain. Yeah. Yeah. That, w- w- there's a couple of those too. Like Oliver Sacks has one and there was another psychologist or something, but David Byrne's thing was, was more about like, uh, a lot of the book talks about, he talks about the environment in which music is created. And I thought I thought it was fascinating. It kind of stuck with me after that because he talks about CBGBs as being just the perfect place for what was happening at that time. And there are some places Sorry, I, I think that are really conducive to like what about being CBGBs? supportive in, of musicians. And other places you're like, yeah, oh, you know, who knows? So uh, what? Yeah. Are the, if you were going to put together, what are the what are some of the places in New York that you like to play? Well, um, Fat Cat I like, you know, because mm-hmm. it's just kind of like. Um, the integrity of the music is, is high there, you know, but it's also like, it's not stuffy. People are just hanging out, you know? And like, yeah. Um, it's not so, um, laser focused and it's not like you can hear a pin drop or it's like a recital type vibe. Um, sure. I also really like, uh, uh, Greenwich house music school, which is like, um, like a really old, building in the west village a little bit south of all that stuff of, of fat cat and smalls and everything and mm-hmm. it's like um an old wooden building and they have a room and they have music in there 
and they have a, a concert series, and it's just like something about the room sounds great, man. I've seen mm. a few big bands play there and some small groups, and I'm just like, this is a really nice room. And uh, it's very like, it's a concert setting, you know, it's not a bar, um, but it's just a nice relaxed vibe, and I like that about it. And um, the other thing I like about those places is like, it's not so much um, like, pressure applied to promotion and sales and things you know like mm -hmm. it's really hard for me to perform and be like reflective and think about the music when like i'm freaking out that there's not enough people in the room you know um it's like the separation of art and commerce uh that uh it's becoming more apparent to me as i get older you know yeah and i get it like these clubs can't operate if there's not people there buying tickets and buying drinks and things. But it's also like, um, it's my responsibility a hundred percent to bring everybody to the club, you know? Yeah. It's, um, it's tough. You know, I, I was playing, I'm not going to say where, but I had a gig at this place. Um, it's kind of a network of places that are run by the same booker, uh, around the city. And I had a gig slated with this band, um, at uh at one of them and like they're like send us your website and a and a group and a, and a flyer and all this stuff and i was like it's just a pickup band like there's not a you know what i mean there's not a it's not a band uh it's just like guys getting together to play tunes and i was like okay cool and then like a week went by and they're like we didn't get your stuff so we canceled your gig or like <laughs> and i was yeah, i was kind of like okay all right fine so we did the gig at um uh we did the gig at iBeam and it was great and friends showed up and it was really fun, you know, and yeah. I'm like, this is more preferable, you know, to these places where like you, they pass around a tip bucket and you have no idea if what they're giving you is what people actually put in. Right. You know? Yeah. And you get like a drink ticket or something. It's just like, it's, it's, uh, can leave you feeling a little, um, unsatisfied. Yes. And I've, I've definitely had those experiences where you're playing in places where they, uh, sometimes they have a little bit more of a corporate atmosphere and you don't know if you're actually getting paid or what's happening. And I started yeah. doing that. I started saying, all right, well, I would rather lose money in some respects and uh, put it, put together a show at an art gallery like Skull Street in Williamsburg yeah. or whatever and have X number of people show up and just be there to play the music. So it takes all of that weight yeah. off of you as the promoter. It's exactly. funny. I, I, I struggle with this, just the idea that we have to run our own operation but there's got to be a better way man because so much of the time like if you're a musician in new york who, who are your friends your friends are other musicians and they've got yeah. gigs that they are going right. to so right. you can't expect you know just in within your network necessarily for all those people to show up at whatever gig is going to happen so yeah. then you have to look for places that are going to have either a built-in audience the, the places that are kind of I would say one of the places that, that seems to work uh, is like the Django, for example, because yeah. being in the, was it the Ace Hotel, right? Roxy. Roxy. I'm thinking of, yeah, 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 Roxy. That's right. Uh, being in the basement of the Roxy, they have a certain audience that's going to come in because it's a cool yeah. vibe in there and because they're, yeah. they're in New York for business or whatever it is that they're doing and yeah. they want to hear some jazz music. And there's a lot of places they're on like a date that or something show. like that, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, it's a vibe. And that's like that's the a big part of the roots of jazz that I think gets gets lost sometimes. It's like shh, they're playing, they're playing a song. Everybody, be quiet. You know, it's like, I mean, I know some people don't like to play in a room where people are talking, and sometimes it, it gets pretty loud in there. You know, I'll say, but like, I do love playing in there because um, it's just fun, man. Yeah, it's fun. It's not like, you know. I'm a serious guy, but like, just like when you go into a, a club and everybody on the bandstand is like cool and posing and they're like got you know it's just like okay we get it yeah like, right you're, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. you're a brooding intellectual like i know you know <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm with you yeah but you think about like you listen to art blakey and there's no way art blakey's standing on the stage saying like like that's in its own right is party music like freddie hubbard and wayne shorter and curtis fuller and lee morgan and whoever else is in involved i mean these are geniuses and these are people that yeah. are as intellectual as anybody or whatever but you go yeah. listen to art blakey play a drum solo and say you know this is polite music you know this is supposed yeah, right. to be it comes from party music yeah man 
It's rowdy. And that's the value of, I think that's, that's you know, it's the same thing with uh, Fat Cat or whatever. There's a vibe in there that's just like, all right, you can either play pool or ping pong or whatever, or hang yeah. out and listen to this band play. And I, I yeah, yeah, I like that vibe too. There's a place, there's a time and a place for like, all right, this is a quiet back room and, you know, somebody's going to play yeah. like a... I mean, yeah, I, I want to say, I'm, I'm not like, I don't mean to talk shit on those. I think that's a really important, you know, when somebody, sometimes I'll see somebody's playing um, like Rich Perry, for example, and I'm like, oh man, he's playing in this nice quiet room, and it's just going to be him and like a piano player and a bass player. Like I'm going to that. Like I can hear somebody, like without any noise. You know, that's really appealing too. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. So there's 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 room for everything. It's exactly know? that's exactly right. But it's it seems as though I think in jazz world we get so far into the like any other show you go to is a is going to be rowdy in its own right, and we lose track of that even. No matter how highfalutin whatever the music gets, it it still yeah. can have that root in whatever. I know. really appreciate the guys who are I, the, you know, like um, you know these guys like Chris Ott and Kai Sandoval and and um, the Hunter Tones and all these guys who are doing like the brass band thing. I don't know if you do a lot of that stuff. I don't really do it. Um, it's really demanding on the chops in a way that I I'm not happy about. Sure, yeah. Um, but like. I just love that those guys are out there like playing that playing music for people yeah. at beer gardens and stuff and they're playing cool music and they're playing it really well, you know, and, and I, I'm so happy that some person who doesn't know anything about music can go to a beer garden and hear a trumpet playing and a trombone and like, wow, that's, you know. Yeah, 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 for sure. Like, that's so that's so important because like there wasn't a lot of that going on when I was growing up. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, it was like no, no horns in pop music or hip hop or anything. Sure. Know? Yeah, the brass band thing has t- definitely taken off in the last couple of years, yeah. uh, and it is it is cool. Yeah, uh, so let's do a couple of these tunes. Let's go through a couple of these things because I got okay. I'm a little curious about some of these the origins here. I now when you're when you go to write, are, do you have a do you have are you the kind of person that that will spring from the bed from your your slumber in the middle of the night with some idea and write it down, or do you have a particular approach or what is it that compels you to write tunes i used to do that when i thought it mattered you know uh like oh but this idea is so valuable i better go write it down and then i wake up the next day i'm like this is stupid you know it's like four (laughs) notes this doesn't mean anything that takes a lot john i don't know man i don't know if i'd have Um, that I wrote one thing like that in recent memory that I can think of that I made a video out of, um, and it's on YouTube. It's called, uh, it was like an introduction to, um, uh, 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 a monk tune. I don't know. It's like a very kind of avant-garde thing uh, with like prepared piano. And I was like laying in bed and I was hearing this motif over and over again. And that, that came out pretty well, but, um, you know, more what I do as a, as a rule is um, I find it, I think it's got to start for me with melody. You know, I think when I was younger, I was like, oh, look at this cool bass line and uh, these cool pads and these hip like rhythms. It's like if it doesn't have a melody to me, I don't know what the composition is, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so I'll find a melody either uh, walking. I love to walk. Um and do hikes and stuff, and I can find a melody like that. I can find a melody on my trumpet. Um, I can sit at the piano, and sometimes I'll just challenge myself, like, you know, what if uh, my motive is, like, up a sixth and down a second, you know, and I can, from three notes, I can develop a whole composition from that. And it's really, um, it's just a useful skill to have to to, to learn how to write a melody. Um, it doesn't, it's not like some are better than others. You just get good at doing it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and then, like, you have a melody. Cool. Now, what's the composition going to be? You know, what's the, what are the, what's the harmony behind that? What, you know, in jazz music, we want to have some rhythm happening, like, the, like some interesting hits and some interesting, like, uh, con- there's got to be contrast on all those, all three levels of that, of the, uh, of the composition, you know, and that's, um, part of the process. So I'd say most of what I do writing wise happens at the piano, which I'm a really not a good piano player. Like I, I literally could not comp through a tune for somebody. Um, 
but that's I just go really slow. Mm-hmm. I go really slow, you know, and I and I just get it to where it's like it has a character and everything makes sense and fits within that character, you know. Sure. I wonder if that's I, I I like to think that that's an advantage in some respects because I am also a very slow, terrible piano player. But you know. but I I feel like if I were to write melodies on the trumpet, it would be more likely to be soloistic in a sense. Whereas writing on the piano, I find myself having to be thoughtful about what it is that I'm choosing to play. I'm going to mm-hmm, maybe mm-hmm. leave more space or choose more carefully what I'm doing. Whereas I might play something that would just be like, you know, something I might just throw out in the middle yeah. of a tune. Otherwise. Well, there's, you know, there's reason to do it different ways because you get different results. You know, if you, some people like to write in logic, for example, mm-hmm. um, you're going to get a different sounding tune that way, you know, than if you, if you, you know, maybe it's cool to write something that's very uh, instrument specific and very, it's like really challenging to do on the trumpet. Um, in a set of music, I think variety is so important when you, if I go to a, a set and a lot of another reason why I don't go out as much anymore besides COVID is um, like hearing somebody play for an hour and 20 minutes. I, it's like after three or four tunes, sometimes it can get very repetitive, you know, like um, it's got to have there's got to be some some breath in there and some some contrast within each song and then the set at large, you know, so that's what I try to do with the record. So there's some stuff that I wrote um, at the piano that's more epic and overarching and some stuff that's more cellular and simple and uh you know i just um that's really important to construct uh a a broad view of what you're going to play you know sure no doubt well let's do one of them uh seven angels yeah where did the title of that come from man that's a great question um it's actually quite embarrassing uh there's this joke that i learned in high school that I'm not going to repeat for you. Um, it's like, it sounds kind of like that title is the punchline. Um, but I, I originally titled it that and then uh, just as a joke. And then I changed it. I was just like thinking of the tune and thinking about myself and my career and, and uh, where I'm at in my life. And uh, another thing I... I tap into sometimes is i i'm i have synesthesia oh really which, yeah i don't know do you know what that is i i know fundamentally what it is but what does that mean for you and so, it takes different forms doesn't it yeah it can it, it can the, i have one of the most common forms uh, which is like when i see a word written or um like for example when i see a word written every letter in that word has its own specific color or and texture you know, like, um, and then when they, certain letters come together to form a word, then that word has its own kind of like color pattern or gradient, you know, hmm. to it based on the letters that are in it. What do you mean and by texture? Same, well, like some letters could be shiny and some letters could be rough texture. Like some letters could be like a neon light and other letters could be like a scratchy wool blazer, you wow. know, like a nat, like a natty blazer or something like that. Um, and not, it's the same with numbers, and it's also the same when I'm improvising and when I'm composing. Like a C minor has a different color; every note has its own color, and every um, and therefore the chords are like words. They they like a scale is is really like a line of colors, you know. Wow. Um, and then a, a sound can have a color, like a saxophone can have a color that's different than a piano, and and this saxophone player can sound different, can have a different color than that saxophone player. Um, so these are all different ways in which it manifests for me. Uh, some other people have it related to their uh, sense of smell. It's, it's really a crossing of the senses, you know? Sure. And these are, these are not colors that I actually see in my eye, like an aura that I see around, like you, for example. But in my mind's eye, this is what I see. Like if I tell you to imagine a basketball you know, you're thinking of a basketball. That's where I would see the color, kind mm-hmm. of on a movie screen in my head, you know? Sure. So Seven Angels, um, to me, is just very, like, the way the colors work out is very pastel and 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 um, calm, and it's like blues and purples and, and some greens, and um, it just kind of came together with the, the album cover, 
which is uh, so Seven Angels is the title track, and the the cover art is a, a photograph that I took um, in my hometown at sunset over like an icy lake, and uh, and I started just thinking about like you know where I'm at and why I'm able to release this record, and it's because of all my teachers that I've had and uh, my parents who encouraged me to become a musician, and you know my wife who supports me uh, with what I want to do, and she she wants me to to push myself and not just take the gig that pays the rent, but she wants me to like be creative. And, and I'm just so grateful for all of that. Um, so it's kind of like a, an idea about guardian angels or people looking out for you or some, some greater force kind of guiding you. Um, I wouldn't say there's seven of them that I could name for you. You know, it's not quite that precise, but it's just an overall sense of, of gratitude and, and feeling like, I'm in this place that I am to release this record because of uh, the people in my life and the, the forces that have kind of directed me this way and, and supported me. You know? Sure. That's amazing. And it's amazing, too. I mean, it's a good title not only for the tune then, but also for the whole album, to, to yeah. title the entire album in that regard. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. I was going to ask you if you put the lake on the cover because your name is Lake and it'd be a representation. Feels a little mundane after such that's a the profound. That's the truth. Wow, you found me out, man. <laughs> that's the that's the actual story. I didn't think anybody would get that, but Bobby, smart. Hey, I'm on it, man. I'm on it. I got a degree in philosophy. <laughs> that's I great did too. get that a lot growing up. Growing up on a lake and being Lake, you know. Oh yeah. Where, oh, where yeah. are you from originally? I'm from a, a small town in Ohio. It's called Salina. Um, it's spelled with C-E-L-I-N-A, and it's north of Dayton and south of Lima, which is where Joe Henderson is from, Lima, Ohio. Okay. Um, it's really out in the middle of nowhere, about 10,000 people. Uh, we got a Walmart when I was in high school. It was a big deal. You know, it's the country, basically. Sure. I, I, yeah. I sense a little Joe Henderson influence in not only the fact that you played a Joe Henderson tune, but in yeah. your playing in general. I wonder if that's your affection for his playing or if that's something in the air around that part of the world. Man, I just love that period of music that he was writing. I think, you know, everybody talks about what a great writer, for example. I mean, you know, jazz musicians, um, we all love all these guys, Bill Evans and John Coltrane and everybody. Everybody talks about like Wayne Shorter as being this, you know, genius writer. And he is a genius writer. Joe Henderson is also a genius writer. And I think he doesn't get enough credit for that, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but his tunes are just so colorful, man. And I, I mean that in respect to like my synesthesia and the way I experience them, but also um, in the you know the sense that a normal person would say it. Just like great chords and great melodies, and just like um, I just really appreciate his stuff. And I, I he's a big inspiration for me when I try to write a a, a tune, you know. I sure. try to follow his example. He's got so many, so many amazing ones. Mm -hmm. You're Kenny Dorham guy. A little bit. I appreciate Kenny Dorham, but I don't like. I don't spin him that much, and I I feel guilty about it. I feel like I should more, but um, you know, he's kind of like when he was playing, he kind of took a backseat to like Freddie Hubbard and Miles Davis and the guys who were like the A listers. You know. Sure. I mean, he was an A lister too, but. Um, he was never quite as prominent as those guys. And, um, you know, I appreciate uh, what he's doing, um, but I just have other other heroes, you know. Sure, no doubt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody's got their own thing. Of course, he's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, how about, what are Pearls of the Tartar? Um, so that title comes from, that's the tune that is dedicated to Horace Silver. And that title comes from... Um, there's a book by Fyodor Dostoevsky. It's called The House of the Dead. And it's about a time when... Uh, it's, a, it's a fiction, but it's based on a, a period of time where Fyodor Dostoevsky was sentenced to a, a Siberian prison camp um, for being a political dissident, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, he writes from experience, basically, about what it's like to be in, in, that, uh, in that time. Uh, and it's horrible. Yeah. Horrible! Shh. Don't go to Siberia and get in a prison camp. <laughs> Good, and I'll put I'll write that down. I'll keep yeah. that in my notes. If you learn one thing from this podcast, <laughs> don't be a political dissident in uh, you know 19th century Russia. Um, but there's a there's a phrase in there, and I at this point I don't even remember what it's about. But he's like uh, something somebody gets 
something nice and it's uh, he says it's like casting pearls before a tartar so what that phrase means is like the tartars were the um the huns basically like genghis khan uh not the huns sorry genghis khan um and like these guys would like just sack villages you know mm -hmm. and they were warlords they rode around on horses and slept in the dirt you know um but they would sack these towns and steal all the finest clothes and jewelry and all this stuff. And they would wear them until they like fell off in battle, you know, and they would like get dirty and everything. Um, so it's this idea of like, you could have something super valuable and uh, something that somebody really spent a lot of time crafting and, and commands a high price, but it's just like, um, you know, to, in, in front of the wrong person, it, it's meaningless and it's, it's, you know, can just be destroyed. Uh, or just not appreciated in the way that it was intended, you know? And I, I think of, like, Horace Silver because he's he's such a brilliant pianist and composer, but, uh, you know, jazz is oftentimes, like... Um, it's funny because we go to school with classical musicians. Back in his time, there wasn't, like, jazz school, you know? You just went and you were a, a classical musician and you learned how to play jazz on your own. But it's the idea that, like, that somehow his compositions wouldn't be as valuable as, uh, you know, a classical composition when, I, you know, I think they are. I think they're uh, pretty close to it. Uh, there's some tunes of his like uh, Ekaro, and it's just like, wow, this is such an amazingly conceived piece of, piece of music. Uh, and it's, it's, to me, it's like me seeing value there um, when other people might just think it's, it's jazz or bar music or something like that. You sure, know? yeah. Wow, that's something else. How, how did the um, how did the intro to that tune come about? Um, well, I wrote the intro material. I love to give musicians an opportunity to um, uh, improvise. Sounds a little obvious, you know, but like uh, really search for something and and come up with something interesting. And I know for me, like. It's a lot easier when I have a little something, a little kernel to start with, you know. So that tune starts with these major sevens, bum bum, bum bum, bum bum, and it was kind of to me evocative of like, you know, pearls, like in a sort of like a, you know, in a seabed, and you just see like a little twinkle here and a twinkle here, and um, so I gave Stephen that that opening motive of the major sevens, which is like a prominent motive in the in the tune itself. And um, just kind of said, man, just go at it, you know, like start with that motive and then and then go from there. And uh, that's what he did. And it was like, man, Stephen is, is such a deep cat. And I knew he was going to come up with something great. And he did. So when I heard him like going bang, bang, bang on the piano and letting the low end, I was like, yes, <laughs> yeah. this is what I wanted. <laughs> you that's know? great. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So when you when you write these tunes. Do you write the tune first and then say, and then you're trying to find a way to title them effectively? I, I ask this because there's a philosophy behind this and everybody's mm -hmm. got a different approach. Some people like Anthony Braxton or somebody just says, all right, it's going to be numbers because we don't care and we don't want to evoke anything in someone's mind. Other people try to come up with a specific theme and write to that or create a story around yeah. the theme. Uh, well, Anthony Braxton is also synesthetic. Um, so he would, I think on some of his compositions, he would say that, like, oh, this composition is what XJ227 looks like, you know? Um, wow. In his I mind's did not eye. know that. Yeah. He's a synesthete. So for me, it's like, I like to read. I read books, and I like words. I'm not like a crazy literati. Like, um, there's some books I have a hard time getting through, like uh, Ulysses or um, Absalom, Absalom, Faulkner. It's just like dense, you know, a little too dense for me. Um but I'll, I'll, you know, when I think of tunes, I really, I try to leave words out of it. And I just try to think in, in musical terms. Sometimes a, a mood can inspire me or like, um, you know, you say like a, a horse-drawn carriage going down the street. I could maybe come up with a melody from that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, sort of uh, programmatic. But like, I really just conceive of music as music. And then I'll come, I'll have a list of titles on my phone, like words that I like or phrases that I like, and I'll kind of um, 
just keep those on standby. Uh, if I find a tune that fits it, I'll, I'll add it in there. Um, but, you know, I think I would like to try writing something a little more programmatic, like, like a suite and, and try to think of like, um, you know, what, what is this concept? What would this sound like? You know, um, could be in, like a story, you know, like an actual story that happened in real life and, and try to realize that through music. I think that's an area for me that I would like to explore in the future. Sure. Um, it's kind of something with a narrative to it, you know, but, you know, a lot of the stuff on this album is like somewhat detached from that. Sure. It's interesting. I think that maybe speaks to the idea also of just variation and different approaches to that. Yeah. Um, I know, I don't know if it was last year or the year before or something, you were doing the BMI Composers Workshop, and Bob Brookmeyer yeah. would talk about just, all right, just fill the page with music. It doesn't have to be about anything in particular. You know, there's different yeah. exercises that were in many regards very sort of, I don't know if theoretical is exactly the right word, but it was. It had yeah. a lot to do with just, all right, putting notes on a page to come up with something new. Not that it didn't evoke emotion or there wasn't a powerful they weren't powerful pieces but just the approach was so much different than somebody who may say like oh no i want to i want to convey this specific story or this feeling yeah. or whatever and there's no reason that somebody you can't do all of them well everybody gets at it differently you know uh one thing i will say and this was i did not know this before i was re releasing this record but from a like a marketing standpoint or a, just like an album release standpoint it's a lot easier for press folks um, to grab hold of a record if there's a narrative to it or there's like some underlying theme, you know, um, just some dudes playing original music is like hard to sell, you know, because <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like there's a lot of that. <laughs> there's a lot of that. Sure. But if you can say like, oh, this record has an incredible story, um, you know, it's easier to get people to maybe pay attention to it a little bit more. So that's something um, for me to think about going forward. And uh you know, I can I can get with that. Again, it's like it's like finding a way to do it that's authentic and that speaks to me. You know, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. Yep. Are uh, are there any other tunes or or concepts from the album that stand out to you as as uh, as uh, particularly, let's say, poignant? Um. Huh. I will say I enjoyed the whole thing. I think it's oh, a thanks, great man. record, and I. I hope that all the people go out and pick up a copy, buy it direct on CD or something, so that you get that. Yeah, don't we, just, have, we have. Don't just stream it. Go out and buy that album. Well, I'd rather people just listen to it. That's my number one goal. You know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I my number one goal, John, is to get people to buy your album, get oh, that money, that. so you can make a new one. It's not always You've that always easy. Been supportive of me. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I like sync Signal Changes uh, is a cool one, and that has Michael Thomas on it, mm. and he plays an amazing solo on that. That's my favorite one. Really? Yeah. The, the six True. eight. The... Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that, that, that that's awesome. my favorite one. Thanks, man. Yeah. Um, what is this, what is I, Signal Changes, or what is that? What was the concept behind that? Um, I think a lot about sometimes like uh, signaling people you know there's a tune on one of my old uh those jazz rock records i was telling you about called mixing signals that i wrote it's like learning how to communicate with people for some reason escapes me sometimes you know sure. i've had like uh like why is this person saying this to me like actually thinking about not just reacting to things but like uh kind of thinking about why they're saying this to you know or doing this thing or acting like are they showing me that they're concerned about this or um you know the idea of like signaling to people not just talking to somebody but signaling to somebody um who you are and uh and what you're about is is interesting to me mm. um and then you know living in new york and running the subway there's always signal problems on the subway. <laughs> sure. Um, but, yeah, I don't think there's much more to it than that. It's just an interesting concept, mm -hmm. you know? For sure, yeah. All right, well, we'll wrap up here. Uh, cool. Let me ask you this. Well, I'll, I'll give you yeah. one final one that's pertinent to the times here. Is right. uh, How are you doing through this whole coronavirus operation, and what are you doing? To, are, are you one of these people that has taken advantage of the free time to be super motivated or is it difficult to operate without 
the gigs coming in or in terms of like motivation to continue to make stuff or how, how are you holding up? Yes to all of that. Um, you know, you go on Instagram and everybody's like, oh, I wrote an 83 uh, piece symphony. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and I played all the instruments on it, too, by the way. And here you go. And it's just like, I suck. You know, I'm not doing anything. Um, but I'm like being easy. I'm going easy on myself, man. I mean, this record took, has taken a lot of time and energy. And I'm, I'm saying, man, just get the record out. You know, just get the record out. Um, I miss seeing my friends. Uh, although I have started to, to go out and, and meet people at the park and socially distant, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I miss, I don't, you know, it's funny, I don't miss playing all the gigs. I was playing a lot of gigs, you know, and uh, I don't miss having the trumpet on my face all the time. Um, I'm really proud of, that I was able to do that and maintain, you know, chops and, and, uh, and work on the trumpet, but like, it's brutal, man. It's really brutal, and it hurts your face. It yeah. hurts. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah. Um, so, like, I was getting a little burned out, to be honest with you. And so um, I think when the, the first shutdown first started, I didn't play for, like, six weeks. Wow. Um, and now I'm playing again. People are doing recording projects, and I'm, I'm happy to be doing stuff. And I, I, I do – I like to practice what I want to practice, you know, not just – so I don't sound like uh, an idiot on Saturday when I have to play this line that I can't play, you know, um, sure. practicing what I, my buddy Mike Saylor said, like, I feel like I'm in high school again. I'm just playing whatever I want to play. Yeah. Um, and that's true. I have been getting out on my bike. I love to ride bike, um, doing uh, taking some pictures again. My film shop reopened, so I'm able to continue taking photographs, which I like to do just around my neighborhood. Nice. Film, um, film photographs. Yeah, cool. I just like to do things that I'm a bit of a nerd and I like to do um, things that just take me out of my head. You know, when you're walking down the sidewalk with a camera, you're not thinking about your problems or like, what am I going to do about this? What am I going to do when uh, unemployment runs out? You're just like looking for things to take pictures of, you know? Sure. Um, so trying to find activities like that to keep me from freaking out about the economy and the government and the election and all the you know, yeah. all the things that we love to freak out about. <laughs> For sure. How do you think you how can take... You, can I ask you, man, how are you doing? Man, about the same, but maybe the opposite. So I, when, I, when it, we first had the shutdown, nobody knew what to expect. So I already yeah. had the momentum of, all right, it's winter time. I'm trying to get things ready to go for like spring and summer booking gigs and get ready to, you know, do whatever. And so when it hit and we were indoors, I found it was an opportunity for me to go back and practice a lot of the stuff, like you're saying, that I haven't, I didn't get a chance to practice. So I yeah. was playing all the time. Like I, I got, I got better for a, for a couple of weeks. I was like, I, yeah. I was, I'm on it, man. I'm ready to go back and play. And then after a couple of months, or maybe a month or so, I mean, in the middle of April, I was like, what are we doing here? Like. And now I'm, I'm going through these phases of like one day I'll wake up and be like, great, I've got all the time. I can spend some time writing new music and playing trumpet and getting ready for when things come back. And then the next mm -hmm. day I'll wake up and in this like existential crisis where I'm like, wait a minute, does, is my role in society completely gone? Do I have any purpose? Like, what am I supposed to do? I can't play. I've been playing gigs since I was, you know, 16 or whatever, like all the time. Yeah. And all of a sudden yeah. I don't have this outlet. And it's, yeah. it's, it, it goes day to day. Like I'm, I go from being like cool, having the extra time to being sort of borderline depressed about not being able to go out and play. And, yeah. you know, I'll tell you at the end of it, I'm definitely going to have a new perspective on everything that I was doing. And I don't yeah. know how we're going to use it necessarily, but next time I play a gig and it's a full room of people and there's a bunch of people like rowdy and throwing beer all over each other and everything, you yeah. know, instead of being like, look at these idiots, I'm going to be like, yeah, here we are. We get, we're back. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I think it's going to bring a new light to what it is that we're doing. Do, totally do, yeah. do you think you'll take that, that sense of uh, the greater sense of relaxation and try to apply it? There's also a bunch of stuff like Emily and I have been like, on Sunday afternoons, we'll go for walks and stuff. I'm like, yeah. when did we ever? We never did this in our whole relationship. We didn't have time to Who do walks? this. Yeah. Who, Who walks just? Anywhere? Oh, what are we gonna do this afternoon? Well, we've got nothing to do. So yeah, that's something that I would love to try to hold a, on to as we get back very into New York 
problem. Um, I was talking to my friend about this, and a lot of uh, people are leaving town and maybe not coming back because they yeah. realize, like, my one friend said, uh, you know, it's like being in a circus, and there's no time to sit down and ask yourself, uh, do I, am I really, like, is this how I want to live my life? You know, right. the busyness <laughs> thing. Um, and he's like, we were just clowns, and we didn't even know it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, like, That's there's a lot good. of life to be lived outside of a jazz club, you know, and uh, for some people, and it's just like, it's obvious that that's easier. If you want to have a dog and like, you know, maybe have kids or um, just not grind so hard, it's a lot easier to do that in a place like, you know, um, in the middle of Pennsylvania, for example, or, or anywhere else, you know. Just about anywhere. Cities. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, New York is like, the rents are so high that musicians just have to work constantly, you know, gigging and teaching and um I don't know, man. I love it here. I came from smaller cities, and I wanted to be where there's action all the time, you know? Um, I think when this is over, I'm going to be ready to jump back into it. I'm not so crazy about the revelry, but I just like being in a... Man, playing with a good bass player and drummer, and like, you know, I love playing lead trumpet. You know, I, I this, we've been talking a lot about soloing and stuff, but man, I love playing lead trumpet in a big band with a good trumpet section and a, there's nothing like it man um just mm -hmm. having that acoustical energy around you that's vibrating the air around you it's like i miss that you know um for sure so i think i'll be i'll be ready to get back into that but uh i don't know it's going to be hard to maintain that sense of calm because the rent's still going to need to get paid you know what i mean um so I'm gonna have you're gonna have there's gonna be compromises that have to be made, um, but you know, one thing at a time, man. I mean, yeah, that's all you can do. Let's see how it goes. Yeah. Well, I'll be looking forward to those days, John. I'll be looking forward to going back to <laughs> see you guys play at the Django and grabbing a beer sometime. Yeah, man. Yeah. Thanks for coming out. You've always been supportive, man. I really appreciate it. Just I'm just down. To, I'm here in New York to to be able to be in it, man. Listen to some good music yeah. all the time, and that's that's yeah. that's what I miss, man. Yeah, I'm um, looking forward to it. Well, congrats on the new album. Thanks, Good man. work, and uh, we'll see you on the other side. All right, sounds good, dude. Hey, let's meet up and get a pastrami. We can wear masks. It'll be okay. I'm all about it. I'm all about it. Okay. You pick right. a time. I'll be there. All right, gang. Well, thanks for tuning in for another episode of Jazztopia. Big thanks to John Lake for sitting down with me, giving me some some fresh info on pastrami sandwiches and his musical explorations uh if you like the show and you want to keep up with what's happening you can find me on facebook at facebook.com slash bobby spellman music or on instagram at at bob spellman uh, you can find this podcast on soundcloud at soundcloud.com slash jazztopia podcast or now freshly on Spotify, Apple Music, iTunes, Stitcher, and soon to be YouTube. So look out for that. Uh, if you would like to support the show, tell your friends. Share it on social media and all that good stuff. Uh, we're going to take a short little hiatus once again for the 4th of July week in the beginning of July. But we're going to kick it back into full gear once we get back in town. All right, everybody stay safe out there. Have a good time. Play some music, listen to some records, buy some new music. Go, go, go get yourself a nice pastrami sandwich. All right, all right. Take care, everybody. See ya.